mode. I would like to welcome you all to Division 56 Trauma Psychology webinar series. Today's webinar we have Dr. Kathleen Kendall Tackett from Texas Tech University Health Science Center and Dr. Wendy Middlemiss from the University of North Texas. The title for today's webinar is Early Adverse Experiences Increase the Risk of Adult Health Problems, the Implications of Lack of Responsive Care for Trauma and Long-Term Health. I would like to go ahead and do a couple of housekeeping rules. First of all, please know that all of the attendees are coming in mute, so you will not be able to talk to us. The way that you have to communicate with me is through the questions box, to the chat box. If you have a question during this, the, web, the webinar, please write the question in the box, and I will make sure that I forward the question to Dr. George Rhodes, who um, is going to be the moderator for today's web webinar. With all that being said, I now pass the word to Dr. George Rhodes. Thank you very much. And it's a great to be with you here from Hawaii and from Texas and from D.C. And of course, we want to introduce to you our, our presenters, Dr. Kendall Tackett. It's a health psychologist and international board certified lactation consultant, fellow of the APA in Health and Trauma Psychology and privileged to say that she's our past president of the APA Division of Trauma Psychology. Dr. Kendall Tackett specializes in women's health research, including breastfeeding, depression, trauma, and health psychology. We also have Dr. Wendy Middlemiss with us, who is an educational psychologist specializing in how to translate research into education, prevention, and intervention messaging. Her research interests include infant development, developmentally sound approaches to infant nighttime care, safe sleep practices, and community, school, and family programs to support context for rearing children and adolescents with academic, social, and emotional competence. This is going to be a great workshop as we're looking at the health effects of early childhood adversity. And we'll turn it over to Dr. Kathleen Kendall Tackett. Thank you, George. Um, and thank you, everyone, for, uh, uh, for tuning in for the webinar today. Uh, Wendy and I are actually really kind of excited to present some stuff that uh, often is not seen at kind of trauma workshops, um, but we really think is important. Uh, just in terms of, you know, the, the, the information that's coming out on the impact of early adversity is in some ways very frightening, um, you know, to see, you know, how even some kind of times, you know, sort of accepted normal kind of parenting practices uh, can actually be difficult for, for babies and kind of I think the research I think uh, it also points to you know what we need to be doing uh, to help sort of strengthen you know that uh, bond in families but also um, and how that's going to be preventative in terms of health problems uh, so uh, I'm going to actually show you kind of some of the research you know showing about the impact of the early adversity uh, and then I'm going to actually show you a little bit of mine uh, which I normally don't show in kind of trauma context but I think it was kind of important to sort of give a balance of what kind of things actually can help. Okay, so I'll see how to move my slides. Okay, so I want to kind of actually start off by uh, talking about an article that was published in 2009 uh, in the Journal of the American Medical Association. And this was one that was kind of an important one in the healthcare field because, again, in a sort of a mainstream medical journal talking about the implications of early adversity. And it was talking, it said, neuroscience, molecular biology, and the childhood roots of health disparities. And then say, building a new framework for health promotion and disease prevention. Okay, and there was this one, uh, you know, sort of paragraph head that I have to admit really kind of intrigued me. And I think, again, it's one of the things that I think is so important for us to know is that adult disease prevention begins with reducing early toxic stress. You know, and I think sometimes we are, you know, as kind of practitioners, in some ways a little casual about, you know, some parenting practices that can be forms of early toxic stress for babies, uh, particularly. And it's like, if we can kind of get this part right, you know, we really do set the, the stage for a lifetime of health. But if this is wrong, if, the, you know, if there's constant sort of adversity, you know, the result oftentimes is you know, pretty significant health problems. Okay, so this is actually what they said. They said an increasing amount of research in neuroscience, social epidemiology, and the behavioral sciences suggests that a reduction in the number and severity of early adverse experiences will lead to a decrease in the prevalence and a wide range of health problems. 
Okay, so what are we talking about when we talk about adversity? Well, one of the most famous studies that defined that was the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. That was a study, in case you're not familiar with it, um, you know, that really was in many ways a landmark study because it was the first major study that actually showed the link between what happens in childhood and how that impacts adult health. Okay, and it was uh, the two principal investigators were Vince Felitti and Robert Anda, and you know they uh, researched 17,000 patients from the Kaiser Permanente Health Maintenance Organization. You know, and uh, Vince actually started off kind of as a, somebody who studied child sexual abuse, like a lot of us actually in the family violence field, uh, and realized that you needed to kind of expand the framework um, that it wasn't uh, just child sexual abuse that was a problem. Uh, that in fact there were lots of ways that children could be exposed to adversity. Now what's kind of interesting is we've sort of moved in, in some ways even beyond what the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study defined as adversity and look at more kind of also what's going on not only in the family but what's going on in the community, what's going on in the school, you know, and thinking about kind of, you know, sort of all these things that set up, you know, children for experiencing um, hardship and adversity. Okay, so, you know, I actually kind of took all this uh, information and I, I really kind of came up with sort of four you know, categories, so kind of collapse some of the stuff down. Uh, the first, you know, of course, major type of adversity is childhood maltreatment. That includes child sexual abuse, child physical abuse, emotional abuse, and also neglect. Okay, so again, neglect, of course, is the most common, actually, form of child maltreatment. And, you know, in some ways, we've got some good news, because some of these forms of, of abuse are actually going down uh, and, and reducing. So, you know, again, like I said, although this, in some ways, is a kind of a bleak picture, um, there, there are definitely hopeful signs. Okay, so child maltreatment, of course, parental impairment. Now, this is one I don't think we spend as much time on, but we really do need to talk about. Is you know, if a if a parent is impaired because they're abusing substances, if they have mental illness, and that includes depression, and you're going to be really surprised at how many you know um, children are actually exposed to that. Uh, if there's partner violence going on, or if their parents are involved in any criminal activity, and this these again were all things from the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. Okay, if there's parental loss, now this sometimes is, is not included, but really should be, because we actually have really, you know, good information and good data that shows that losing a parent, particularly at a young age, uh, you know, can be a significant uh, problem. You know, I once saw a uh, documentary on uh, Abraham and Mary Lincoln, uh, and they were, um, both of them actually had lost their mothers at a young age. And what was interesting is, you know, both of them actually, you know, traced this sort of long history of depression, uh, and Mary Todd Lincoln actually had some other mental illness, but traced it to that initial loss. And the research actually supports that. You know, it's like how Lincoln had a lifetime history of depression, you know, and they traced it back to that kind of early loss. So again, losing a parent actually uh, at an early age. But also, and again, this is where we start getting the sort of broader definitions of adversity. You know, things associated with low socioeconomic status. Now again, it's not just being low income. Okay, many low income families are actually really quite functional. Uh, it's the things that tend to kind of co-occur with it. You know, like for example, living in a community where it's unsafe, unsafe housing, um, what they were calling at this conference I was just at, food insecurity or lack of access to food or medical care. Okay, so all of these things kind of become cum uh, cumulative in terms of how they stress children. Okay, so how common are these? And again, like I said, we're really looking particularly at that sort of perinatal period. You know, um, really up to age five is, is really the most vulnerable time, but particularly sort of in that, you know, prenatal and perinatal period. Uh, and so this is actually a sample from Julia Sang looking at 1,581 pregnant women. And you can actually see that, first of all, many of the women themselves reported a history of depression or post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, but 36% had experienced interpersonal violence and 93% had experienced at least one type of traumatic event, you know, that met the definition by the DSM-5 criteria. Now, what's also uh, very concerning is the impact of this looking at health disparities. You know, particularly when you're looking at things like preterm birth in African American communities. You know, we've got actually some data now from recent studies that show actually that preterm birth is more common if you have PTSD prenatally. And what you actually see very, very clearly, and this was actually from Julia Sang's study again, that same data set, is when you were looking at current PTSD in pregnant women, the rate was four times as high in the African American mothers. You know, and I think that this is not something we have addressed at all. 
And again, if you start off by having a baby that's preterm, right there, they're set up for, you know, some of these difficulties. You know, so again, like I said, you know, and, and thinking about in terms of infant mortality, you know, the World Health Organization has identified preterm birth as the number one cause of infant mortality around the world. Okay, you know, there, there are other causes, obviously, you know, infection, infectious diseases is another one, asphyxia is another one, you know, from unsafe sleep environments, which I know Wendy's going to talk about. Um, but these ethnic differences, I think, are really kind of striking. You know, so again, it gives you an idea of how many people we're talking about that are exposed. Um, looking at this in terms of also, you know, prenatal depression, this was comparing in two samples in Boston. One was from the suburbs and one was an urban sample. And if you look at like prenatal depression here, you actually see prenatal depression rates, again, you know, it's obviously higher in the urban sample, 22%. Now again, that's another factor that contributes to preterm birth. You know, and if they have prenatal depression, chances are they're going to have depression postpartum. Okay, so again, these are pretty significant numbers, but look at the histories of lifetime abuse. Again, definitely higher in the urban population, but you know what? It's coming up on 50% in the suburbs. You know, so when people say, oh yeah, you know, this isn't a problem in my patient population. Well, you know, I'm sorry, I hate to tell you this, but it is. Okay, looking at a sample in Peru, you know, history of uh, physical or childhood abuse. Um, so it was related to a number of issues in terms of the health of the women. Uh, Self-reported poor health in early pregnancy, uh, antenatal depression or, or, you know, sort of prenatal depression. Um, so again, we know that that's a factor in preterm birth. That's one big factor. But also, too, you know, we know that the, the stress hormones involved in depression you know, sensitize that infant, and the infant comes out, you know, sort of more hyperreactive. We know from Tiffany Fields' research that these babies don't tend to sleep quite as well. You know, so you can kind of see how you get this sort of cascade. You know, and again, it's one of the things why I feel a certain sense of urgency that particularly in that prenatal period, we need to be talking to mothers about depression and PTSD. You know, because again, you know, if we can address that, we can head off a lot of the problems. Okay, and also, if they had a history of physical or sexual abuse as children, the risk of partner violence, you know, went from, you know, up to two to seven times, depending on the type of abuse they experienced. If they experienced child sexual abuse, their risk of partner violence increased by seven times. Okay, so again, another significant, remember, that's one of the adverse childhood experiences, you know, is, you know, parents involved in partner violence. Okay, looking at our data, we had 6,400 moms from 59 different countries, and you'll actually see again when you think about our population, you know, um, you know, looking at our U.S. sample, our income level was pretty spread. It was, you know, we had a pretty nice distribution, but in terms of education, we had a pretty middle class sample because 73% of our sample had a college degree, a bachelor's degree or higher. Okay, and yet we still have when we asked about the adverse childhood experiences and asked about sort of other traumatic events that they experienced as, as adults. Now this was again, sample of women who had babies zero to 12 months old. And you can see significant histories. So we had 16% of the sample reported uh, rape, of, and 25% reported contact child sexual abuse, 32% uh, re uh, reported uh, parental substance abuse. Uh, and alcohol, of course, was the substance of choice, but it, a really high percentage also reported uh, parents involved in street drugs. Okay, 34% uh, reported physical abuse, and 36% reported parental depression. So you can see, you know, we start adding up these individual A scores. Many of our mothers had very high A scores in terms of, you know, the cumulative number of things that they were exposed to. Okay, so one of the things that we're very concerned about is the impact of early adversity on that developing brain. You know, the brain is actually quite malleable and really very vulnerable in that first five years. And what early adversity can do is actually sort of rewire the brain. Now, again, like I said, sometimes people hear that and they think, oh my gosh, that's just so, you know, so horrible. There's going to be nothing we can do to change that. Well, fortunately, actually, we're finding there are some things that can. You know, but again, like I said, you know, if we can prevent it, that is actually much, much better. Okay, and what we can think about in terms of how this impacts health is looking at the impact of childhood adversity uh, impacting a number of different systems because again you expose that vulnerable developing nervous system that you know that vulnerable developing brain um, to you know big bursts of stress hormones then what you actually get is you know number of systems being affected you know so then that sets up you know things like metabolic endocrine cardiovascular the immune system and the HPA access you know so again what you you create is a vulnerability now there can be things that intervene and they make the difference between whether it's going to be a high risk situation where you have a lot of health problems or a lower risk 
You know, so again, intervention actually can really make a difference in, the, in this. Um, and so again, like I said, even if, if children are exposed to adversity, you know, even doing things like you know, providing parenting classes when the children say age seven makes a difference in terms of long-term health. So again, lots of places to kind of intervene in here, but recognize that exposing children to kind of this overwhelming adversity does set them up for health problems. You know, and we can think about it in terms of the stress response. And this is something I always kind of like try, try to bring up when I talk about these health effects. You know, we think about the stress response oftentimes in terms of things like the fight or flight response or the catecholamine response. Okay, again, that's something we've known about since the 1950s. It's very well documented. You know, in the mid, you know, 90s and, you know, early 2000s, we really started talking a lot about the HPA access and particularly the stress hormone cortisol. And in fact, in the trauma field and in the child maltreatment field, we talked a lot about the interaction between norepinephrine from the fight or flight system and the catecholamine and cortisol. Okay, now what's interesting is when you, uh, you know, look at the research from the psychoneuroimmunology field, you know, and they said, wait a second, there's one more player in this stress response, and that is the inflammation response. This is how the immune system actually responds to perceived threat. You know, the immune system increases inflammation. Uh, now, you might think, okay, well, why would it do that? Why would the immune system increase, you know, increase inflammation? Why is that part of the stress response? Well, remember, this whole response is a survival mechanism. You know, it's designed to help people survive. You know, so this, it, it, it is, you know, response to in perceived threat. Now, the inflammation response, you know, two of the very important functions of the inflammatory molecules are to fight infection and heal wounds. Okay, so if your body thinks that you're under attack, doesn't it make sense it's going to prepare in case you get injured? Okay, now the problem is, in terms of long-term health, is this response is meant to be acute. And what happens in ongoing adversity is this is on all the time. Okay, and particularly inflammation is the thing that really causes a lot of the problems that lead to health issues. Okay, so what we got to be thinking about is the babies, you know, we really, you know, if there's good responsive care, you know, find themselves in learning mode. Okay, they're able to grow and develop. Versus if they're not being cared for, if they're being ignored, they often end up in survival mode. And this is when you get that activation of that stress system. Okay, and that is actually, again, when you have that kind of sort of ongoing adversity is when that stress system gets activated. Okay, now one of the things I want to actually talk about, and we don't really talk about this in terms of, you know, oftentimes trauma. It doesn't necessarily, if you think about it in terms of like DSM-5 criteria, it doesn't necessarily meet the definition of trauma. But this is a type of adversity, is a maternal depression. You know, and, and sometimes people say, well, why, why are we picking on the moms, you know? And, uh, you know, I, I, I had a student that was saying that one time. You know, it's like, you know, we were setting all this stuff and saying all these things about the bad effects of depression, you know, for the babies. And what about the moms? And... Well, you know, I think first of all, you know, obviously we care about the moms, but we also need to recognize that depression impairs their ability to be caregivers, okay, and we know that in some very specific ways. Now, there's lots of things that intervene, you know, is it, it depends on how severe the depression is, how chronic, does the baby have somebody that they can interact with? Um, you know, that uh, is not depressed. Um, you know, what is the education level of the mother that makes a difference? Was the baby preterm? You know, but you can kind of see how if, there, if the depression is never addressed, you know, it does actually have an impact. And we see very long-term effects of this. Uh, there was a paper published in 2006, and it was showing kind of like a 20-year longitudinal effect of being raised with parents who were depressed. So it looked at both mothers and fathers. And, and among the adult children, who were then in their 20s, who were raised with parents who were depressed, they had three times the rate of depression, anxiety disorders, and substance abuse. Okay, so, you know, this affects many different systems, and it is a type of adversity. Okay, so I'm going to show you a little bit about kind of why that is. Uh, and probably one of the best ways to kind of understand how depression impacts that baby is by looking at Edtronic's uh, still face mother research. Okay, now in the still face mother research, what he did is he had mothers and babies come in. Now, these were not depressed mothers. Okay, and so you can see this cute little baby sitting there in this car seat, interacting with the mom. Okay, so what he then tells the mother to do, okay, so here they are, they're, you know, just obviously enjoying each other, they're interacting, they're having a wonderful time. What he tells the mother to do then is to not respond to the baby, because what this is supposed to be is an analog for what happens in maternal depression. Okay, so he tells the mother, just sit there and look straight, do not respond. 
Okay, and what you can actually see within a very short amount of time is how stressful this is for the baby. Now, with maternal depression, think about that this is going to be something that's kind of ongoing. It sort of mutes that mother's ability to respond to the baby. Okay, so here she is. She's doing her still face. And you can see immediately the baby starts responding to that. Okay, hey, what's going on? Baby's trying to kind of like get out of that car seat. He's trying to interact with his mom. Mom continues to be still face. Baby starts showing a lot of sign of protesting. You know, it's really, it's really actually scary how quickly this comes up. Okay, baby's still protesting. Kind of still tries to get out of there. Mom, what's going on? What's going on? Baby still faced. You know, mom is still faced, baby cries. Okay, so within just a very few interaction cycles. Now think about that this is chronic. Okay, and we also know from other researchers that when babies participate in this still faced mother, within a very short amount of time, cortisol is released. Okay, and that is actually one of the things that we see with babies who are raised with chronically depressed moms, is we see high levels of these stress hormones, particularly cortisol. Cortisol gets measured in a lot of these studies because it's very easy to measure. You don't have to do a blood test. You can just measure it in saliva. Okay, but we know that this is showing activation of that baby system. And what's concerning about having a baby that's being exposed to cortisol all the time is we know cortisol is actually quite toxic to brain cells. You know, it shrinks things like hippocampal cells. Um, you know, so again, like I said, you know, trying to think about, okay, well, what can we do to sort of decrease that so that survival system gets turned off and that learning mode gets turned on? Okay, and we actually see, we actually see that actually childhood trauma actually changes the function of the brain. Uh, this was actually a recent paper that just came out last year, and it was talking about looking at the gray matter, which is where you get all the sort of neuronal activity in the brain, uh, in the medial prefrontal cortex and the left hippocampus. Okay, and basically we know that these are parts of the brain that are involved in the stress response. And so what you basically have is, uh, you know, an organism who's become then stress sensitized. Okay, so you get this increased sensitivity to stress. I will tell you one piece of good news. There's some research actually on mindfulness-based cognitive therapy that shows you can actually reverse this, even in people who have experienced childhood abuse. Okay, so, you know, like I said, there's definitely some good news in the field, but it does show that this, again, that kind of ongoing adversity reduces that gray matter. Okay, so it's actually changing the function of the brain. Okay, so then you can kind of see these health effects of early adversity, you know, kind of playing out sort of long term. Okay, and so again, like I said, you know, measured at age 15, you see increased stress. Okay, again, that sensitivity to stress, and again, that reflects those changes in the brain, which then by age 15 to 20 results in increased depression. Uh, then you get increased physical health problems. Okay, and what's also scary is that prenatal adversity, okay, so the baby exposed to adversity in utero, they're three times more likely to have high levels of inflammation as adults. Okay, so again, really kind of in that perinatal period is such a vulnerable time. Okay, so what is one of the things that can actually help, you know, with adversity? Well, attachment to that primary caregiver is one of the essential things that actually makes a difference. And in fact, it's, it's, it's essential to survival, even if beyond, you know, food and shelter. And we, of course, see that from the research, you know, that was done in the 1950s by John Bowlby. And John Bowlby was really challenged by his colleagues. You know, because again, remember, at the time, behaviorism was the thing, you know, and so, you know, saying that something like the child's emotional attachment to a caregiver was essential, that these babies actually did, did not receive that were dying, um, was really a radical idea. You know, and he actually stuck with his guns. I mean, and so, in fact, Wendy and I were at a conference just recently with his son, Sir Richard Bowlby, um, and, you know, he talked about what it was like for his dad, you know, really, uh, you know, trying to kind of, put together an idea that was so different. Okay, so uh, Mary Ainsworth, which is his colleague in the United States and the one who developed the way to measure attachment, uh, this was actually the last article that they wrote together before they both passed away. And again, so again, think about it as sort of a distillation of their work. Okay, they said a couple of things were important to promote attachment, proximity and caregiver responsiveness. Okay, and what we want is that secure attachment because that is going to be the thing that will help children weather other storms. And so even if they're raised in a situation where there's adversity, you know, in like say in the community and even other things, you know, in terms of like what's going on in the family, if they can have that secure attachment to the primary caregiver, you know, it helps them weather that. Okay, now the other thing about attachment is that the things that tend to promote it are some of the things we try to extinguish. You know, things like crying. We say, oh, well, just ignore it. 
you know, and it's amazing. There's, you know, the research does not support that. Okay, but it's amazing how much that is part of our culture. But also things like uh, sucking, smiling, clinging, and following. All of these things promote proximity. Okay, they're attachment behaviors, and sometimes these are the very things we try to extinguish. Now we can think about it in terms of why is attachment important, and part of it has to do with this sort of oxytocin response. Now you can think of the oxytocin response as the flip side to the stress response. Okay, so when oxytocin is up, you get well-being, you get affiliation, you get bonding. You know, uh, all over the world, people celebrate family occasions by eating, you know, and food. That's one of the things that promotes oxytocin, that raises oxytocin. We think about it a lot of times with reproductive events, you know, labor, we think about it with milk ejection, we think about it with orgasm, but there's many other things that promote that. And again, you know, having that sort of constant oxytocin system upregulated is a good thing, it's a health promoting thing. Now, in contrast, when the stress response, again, this is the sort of flip side, when it's upregulated constantly, you get more depression and anxiety, you get alienation, you get hostility and strife. So again, what we're aiming for is that having that oxytocin upregulated. Okay, so we know that if a baby develops a secure attachment, that there's long-term payoffs in terms of their adult health. Okay, and you can actually see this. I thought this was a really interesting study. They had 163 people enrolled from birth. They measured their attachment at 12 to 18 months and then followed them for 32 years. This was published just at the end of 2013 in Health Psychology. Now, by age 32, they had a secure attachment as infants. They were less likely to have inflammation-based diseases. You know, what I'd actually love to see is following this out. Okay, so what, what happens in the 50s and the 60s? You know, because what you see here is the setup for lifetime health problems in terms of metabolic disease, uh, diabetes, and heart disease. Okay, so secure attachment can actually help prevent that. Okay, now this is actually, I'm going to just very kind of quickly cover it, but I just really feel like I need to kind of mention this because some of this, this research on adversity is so, you know, grim and depressing. And I want to actually show you one thing that we know that actually really helps. You know, and you know, you may not be aware of this, but the health disparity gap, you know, in infant mortality between uh, white and black infants in the United States, uh, you know, 5.5 per thousand for whites, 13.8 uh, per thousand for African Americans. It used to be that. It dropped to 12.4 uh, just within the last like year and a half. First time it dropped in a decade. The Centers for Disease Control attributed that drop to the increase in breastfeeding. Okay, so again, like sometimes people say, oh, why are you talking about that? It doesn't have anything to do with adversity. Well, it really actually does. Uh, and in fact, it's, it's come from community organizations within the African American community. Uh, you know, so organizations like a group in Atlanta called Rose, Reaching Our Sisters Everywhere, uh, Free to Breastfeed, the Black Mothers Breastfeeding Association, they have been working within their community. And what they're finding actually is that it is decreasing the impact of adversity, even reflected in the infant mortality rate. You know, and the CDC actually credited the efforts of those community groups. Uh, in terms of dropping. Now what's interesting is thinking about it in terms of the intergenerational transmission. You know, because as I said, so many of the young women that, you know, that we see, you know, that are now becoming parents have experienced adversity. Okay, so what can reverse that? Well, what's interesting is taking a look at, you know, this is one of the studies that looked at what are the two things that kind of seem to increase that intergenerational transmission of trauma. So you've got a traumatized woman and, you know, what's going to happen with her baby? Well, infant sleep difficulties and maternal depressed mood. Okay, so those are the two things. So what's kind of interesting, I just want to show you a couple things. These are actually from our study. Um, we actually found that breastfeeding actually helps with those. Um, exclusively breastfeeding mothers get more sleep. It takes them fewer minutes to fall asleep. You know, so in terms of helping with sleep difficulties, they report more sleep. You know, and as a result, they have better energy. You know, again, like I said, you know, if you want to know more about this, I'm, I'm going kind of quickly through this. Um, I've got a bunch of this stuff up on my website. Okay, now that's also reflected then in maternal uh, mental health. And you know, you might think, okay, why is it doing this? Well, remember we're talking about that sort of stress system. You know. There is something physiological about breastfeeding that downregulates, turns off that stress response. Okay, that's actually been really well documented in a number of different studies. So it's a psychoneuroimmunology effect. Okay, uh, we also looked at anhedonia, which is, of course, you know, the inability to experience pleasure. It's one of the other kind of key symptoms of depression. And not surprisingly, you know, when you looked at mother's depression overall. Okay, and again, it's a physiological effect, and what you're doing is actually sort of increasing that responsiveness, you're helping the mother sleep more, and you're lowering their rates of depression. 
Okay, so right here is going to stop that sort of intergenerational transmission of trauma. Now, what's really interesting is to look at Lane Strathern's study of 7,500 mother-infant pairs. They followed them for 15 years. Okay, they looked at uh, substantiated cases of child maltreatment. They had 500 cases of those. And they found that breastfeeding actually made a difference. This was published in Pediatrics. Uh, they said mothers who breastfed for four months were 3.8 times less likely to neglect their children. And I really honestly think some of this is because it makes them less depressed. Uh, but also it decreases the risk of physical abuse. Okay, so again, like I said, you know, what it's doing, and, and this is like talking about responsive care, okay, because, you know, for breastfeeding to work, you have to be responsive to the baby. And if you're not, breastfeeding doesn't work, okay. And again, it's a physiological effect. It's improving the mother's sleep. It's, it's helping lower her risk of depression. You know, so then a question a lot of times people ask me is, okay, yeah, but what about mothers who've been sexually assaulted? You know, they're not going to want to do this. Well, you know, it's kind of interesting because we, we had such a large sample of moms, you know, who reported you know, uh, both childhood sexual abuse and rape. And so we specifically looked at rape in this particular set of analysis. Okay, so the impact of sexual assault. Um, we had 994 women who reported this. Uh, now, what's interesting is, you know, sexual assault, not surprisingly, had a pervasive kind of negative effect. You know, looking at, you know, it cut down on the, their total sleep time the minutes to get to sleep, both of these are kind of key indicators of depression. Uh, anything, you know, 25 minutes and above to get to sleep is a big risk for depression. You see the moms are really heading that way. Uh, also, lower reported lower physical health uh, and higher rates of current depression. Okay, so sexual assault had a sort of pervasive negative effect. Now, what's kind of interesting, also, you know, anxiety obviously was higher. Um, does breastfeeding help with this? Um, well, first of all, you know, the question a lot of times people ask is, well, yeah, but breast, you know, sexual assault survivors are not going to breastfeed. Well, what was interesting is they breastfed at exactly the same rate. Okay, so again, like I said, this is something I always tell practitioners. You know, it's important to kind of recognize, um, you know, this and not sort of, you know, assume that mothers aren't going to want to. Uh, we had a pretty, we had a really high rate. And in fact, that's consistent with two smaller studies that found higher intention to breastfeed and higher initiation among women who had a history of childhood sexual abuse. So not surprising. But this is the thing, I wanted to just show you this. This is the, these are the findings that absolutely blew my mind. We had these published a couple of years ago. Um, again, it's a psychoneuroimmunology effect. You know, is that, you know, when mothers exclusively breastfed, now you can see they're the mothers here with the green line. When they exclusively breastfed, yes, there was still an effect, but what it basically did is dial it down. You know, and again, there's something about that sort of responsivity of care that creates a physiological effect, and we know it upregulates that oxytocin system. It downregulates that stress response, and you can actually see it very clearly reflected here. Minutes to get to sleep, again, still obviously an effect, but definitely better. Uh, I thought this one was really interesting, angry or irritable. You can see here with the green line, you know, the, the exclusively breastfeeding moms are really kind of chill. Uh, but look at the spike that goes up. And again, that's very consistent with post-traumatic stress disorder. And, and then you start thinking about it in terms of Lane Strathern's study, you know, uh, in terms of, you know, the, that increased risk of physical abuse. And this really does actually make sense. You know, now again, the, the, it's important to know the majority don't abuse, you know, but just think about here is a tool you know, that's going to make a difference. And same thing with depression. Okay, so what I want to kind of just conclude by saying is that, you know, exposure to early adverse experiences has long-term implication for health. Okay, and that responsive care is the early key, you know, is, is the uh, responsive early care is the key to kind of preventing that. You know, now I showed you the breastfeeding data, and I would like to just say, you know, that many of these effects you can actually get by just teaching parents, you know, responsivity. You know, there was a, a study that was published in the 90s in child development, and they randomly, you know, assigned mothers who were kind of high risk for abuse and neglect. They assigned them to either they had the baby carriers, you know, those little buckets, you know, the kids that they carry babies around in, or a soft carrier where they wore the babies. Okay, and then, in fact, they found actually at the first three months the mothers were more responsive if they were carrying the babies, uh, but also that uh, the, the babies had more secure attachments. You know, so again, you know, I've shown you, you know, some of our breastfeeding data because, again, like I said, the fact that we're getting so much movement within these really high-risk communities, um, you know, to to sort of change the landscape, I think is important. But you might say, well, yeah, but what about our moms who aren't? Well, teaching that responsive care actually really actually has long-term implications. You know, so again, the, the really the goal that we're after is that secure attachment.
Okay, and the, you know, anything that's going to be really effective is going to help downregulate that stress response. Okay, so that's what we've got to think about. And again, you know, kind of looking long term, you know, if you're working with adults and they're abuse survivors, you know, there's lots of things we know that dial down that stress response. You know, omega-3s, exercise, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, all those things help. Um, you know, so again, we can think about that, but that is actually the key, is thinking about how can we turn off that stress response. Okay, and I just want to end with this quote because I just think this is wonderful. It's from Frederick Douglass. He said, it is easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. And again, I think if we can think prevention, I think we're going to just be in such, you know, so much better shape. Um, I just want to also if, invite you, if you're not on my Facebook list, uh, to, uh, you know, if, if you're interested in these topics, you know, I frequently post on this. Uh, this is my Kathleen Kendall Tackett page. Uh, and also just put in a plug for the Division of Trauma Psychology. Lots of great resources on the, on the website. Uh, and also, you know, if you're interested in becoming a member, there's membership information there as well. Okay, and so with that, I'm going to actually turn over things to Wendy. These are my websites, and uh, you're welcome to contact me through any of these. And a lot of the information that we've talked about today, I've got, uh, you know, the papers and stuff up on my sites. Uh, so anyway, thank you all for attending. I'm really looking forward to hearing the second part with Wendy's talk. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're glad you're here. Hi, um, hi. this is Wendy Middlemiss. Uh, Kathleen, that was wonderful information. I look forward to uh, taking the conversation in the direction of examining what are some of the barriers and challenges to providing early responsive care, as well as how important it is to, um, to provide that support for parents. So uh, as we begin, the goal of our talk today will be to examine uh, in a little bit more detail the importance of responsiveness in early caregiving and uh, why that equates to a risk for trauma when that doesn't occur. One of the things um, that I would like to focus on as we begin is the, the beauty of providing that responsiveness and how, uh, how natural that is within the caregiver and the infant bond, either in the picture that's on the uh, beginning slide, which will come up again, or here, but particularly in the one in the beginning slide, you can see the infant as a very active contributor to the relationship between the mother um, and the baby as they move forward. So we will spend a good deal of time um, looking at that and looking at the importance. What we will look at most clearly is the fragility of the infant's systems, the, re the regulatory systems early on, and the essential component uh, for guiding and building strong systems that the parent is in this relationship. And we will also look at the strengths of the infant's preparedness to contribute to these relationships. And then we will look as well and talk about this in the context of um, what creates, what makes this a challenge for many parents. Okay, so if we move ahead. Um, in the context of the, the care provider and the child, in the context of the family, the parent provides the regulation and the guidance for the child to learn how to be, how to regulate their emotional responses, how to have a sense, as Kathleen's talked about in the, in regard to attachment, that when you face challenges that there is support and a mechanism to be able to deal with those challenges and to move forward emotionally. It's one of the greatest gifts that we can give our children. And you can see here, um, or actually if you just take a moment, you can feel, if you look individually at any one of these pictures, you can, you can feel how your body physiologically responds with the sense of providing care the sense of warmth that we see when we see, um, we see the interaction um, and, and the, the sense of wanting to engage when we see distress. So what that is telling us is that physiologically both the care provider and the infant are um, 
are physiologically prepared to engage in a very responsive and synchronous interaction. And that responsiveness and that synchrony is essential to the well-being of the infant as they develop and actually the well-being of the mother and the infant, the father and the infant relationship. Kathleen has done uh, a wonderful job in outlining what is um, what is the cost of not engaging in that responsiveness early on and it isn't it isn't isolated to those early years but rather because of its importance it develops the trajectory for health and well-being physical health and well-being emotional health and well-being our social in interaction the implications for the brain impact cognitive development so this early responsiveness actually is essential to infants healthy development and their capacity to uh, to be able to calm themselves and uh, their ability to engage socially and have physical health as they move forward. The challenge, however, that we find in terms of infants' care is that there has been a, a general trend in advice to move away from this, the importance and the understanding of the importance of responsiveness. This is seen in, in how, in many cultures, the focus in care for infants moves away from what the infant needs and the uh, focus of the infant in determining um, scheduling for care, responsive care. Uh, and we see this in messages that babies should be able to sleep through the night. You don't want to pick up a baby because um, that will make them unable to regulate their own uh, well-being. Kathleen's discussion of attachment brings out the scientific foundation for, um, for, the, uh, for the corollary of that being actually the case. The more uh, responsive, the more responsive care an infant receives, the more likely then their regulatory systems develop in such a manner that they are able to take care of themselves. That's why secure attachment is associated with a myriad of positive outcomes later in life. Um, however, there is truly, if you spend a good deal of time uh, looking at social media or looking at parent education uh, interventions, a lot of emphasis is placed on the well-being of the care provider, scheduling the infant's um, feeding and, and sleeping and your responsiveness to the infant in a manner that protects the adult. I have actually read recently a quote that um, suggested that when your infant wakes up at night, you should not look them, you should not make eye contact, because if you make eye contact, then they are less likely to easily transition back to sleep, um, which may or may not be the case. I'm, I'm pretty certain it's actually not the case, but, uh, but I don't have the research to show that. However, if you can envision the infant who has woken up, it's dark, and, and they're in, in need of somebody to, uh, to regulate their emotional response, um, whether it's hunger, their physical response, whether it's hunger, emotional response, whether they're distraught, and the mom picks them up or the dad picks them up and, and actively maintains a lack of eye contact. Um, the, the, the distress that would be associated with that was evident in um, the still face experiment as Kathleen uh, pointed out, and uh, you know, but you can, you, we don't need that, and I think one of my points will be we don't, we don't need the still face experiment to understand that to wake up in the middle of the night and to try to make eye contact with your care provider and have that eye contact not, not reciprocated um, would be a very, uh, very distressing type of event. So when we move forward then, um, one of the messages that, that is important to understand and to share with, with care providers is that um, not responding is actually a harmful event for the infant in the terms of developing their capacity to self-regulate. Self-regulation uh, is encompasses the neurological components for self-regulation uh, support, later capacity to attend, later capacity to calm, later capacity to um, 
to deal with stressful events such as going to kindergarten. Um, so not responding compromise, compromises those developing neurological systems, thereby compromising the infant's well-being, and it also negatively impacts on the parent's capacity. And as we go along, um, I'll show you some research that shows how that connection uh, occurs. In beginning, I wanted us to look through a uh, YouTube video that some of you may have already seen, but I, I think it's, it's very descriptive. We'll actually look at two videos through the course of, um, course of our discussion here. I apologize that my system is very slow. What we will see, um, uh, we will skip this out in five seconds. I'm sorry. What we will see is an infant who's in distress, and we will see that lack of responsiveness. I'm sorry, it didn't. I've been having trouble with this. I don't want to waste our time because it, it's very short. Um, however, what you saw was the dog and the baby is there. The parents are not attending to the dog, and the only time that that baby will stop crying is when the dog actually moves back and touches the baby and when the dog howls with the baby. And when the dog moves away to try to engage the adult, um, the baby will start crying again. And now I was doing a webinar. Well, Wendy's talking now. What happens then is that you will see that when there is responsiveness, what occurs is that the external regulation of your emotions, the external regulation of your uh, regulatory systems initially is externally driven. Infants are not capable of calming themselves down. They are not capable of understanding and relieving distress. That actually is initially provided from an external source, the parents um, or care providers, and then through that it becomes internal. and and it is something that we continue to guide as care providers as, uh, as children develop across time. This, uh, provide, this supports their physiological, emotional, and social growth, and it is very, very important to, um, to how they behave later on. There's research that shows pretty clearly that without this, um, infants will uh, will grow to be children who have attention disorders, who ha have uh, weight uh, issues, um, who have great, uh, great challenges. This is a very powerful, I'm not going to try to um, make the screen bigger um, because I think I will lose it as it is now. But I'd like you to watch the infant as the provider of initiator of this interaction. Wendy, it's a Lu Lucia. For some yeah. for some reason, we don't have vi visual of the video. Oh, um, I'm sorry, you're not seeing that video, but what it is, is that there is an infant who is born, the mother's having a C-section, all you really see is her head, and when the baby was crying, the people were taking the baby away from the mother's face. When the baby was not crying, the baby was actually touching the mother's forehead and cheek, and by touching the mother's forehead and cheek and resting the, resting the, the you know, minute old baby resting her head on the mother, that would be where the comfort was provided. The infant, one of the things that, that is essential as a message and, and essential in understanding the importance of responsiveness is that babies within moments, at the very time of birth, are, are seekers of that responsiveness, are seekers of that touch, are seekers of that care provider. And they work very diligently to um, to engage in that uh, in that element of um, of interaction. 
that physiological base, that responsiveness and attunement are the mechanisms by which um, children uh, have the mechanisms by which adults can regulate the stress responses that infants will experience um, from all sorts of different uh, aspects of, uh, of their early care needs, as well the, um, the capacity to uh, respond to cries is, um, is evident in terms of both the mother's and the baby's uh, stress response systems. When this functions well, it provides the mechanism for children to learn and to develop. Uh, when it does not, however, uh, um, it, uh, it leads to very serious uh, outcomes that, um, that are very challenging. The early synchrony, the capacity of the mother and the infant to engage in this responsive care leads to um, adult health uh, because of its impact on um, genetic well-being, uh, its impact on uh, inflammation, its impact on the functioning of the HPA axis as that develops during that, that first year of life. So we will look then as we move forward to um, we will look then as we move forward to what is the occurrence without that responsiveness and how and whether that uh, lack of responsiveness can be interpreted as or experienced as trauma by the infant. It will be my, um, my argument, and I will base it on some, some research, it will, will be my, my position that, that that lack of responsiveness, because of its impact on the regulatory systems and because of its impact on the stress response system, is, does actually create the same outcomes as other traumatic events can early on in life. That synchrony and that interaction with the infant provides a very important foundation neurologically and physiologically for the infant to continue to develop uh, and begin to guide and regulate its own, uh, his or her own um, responses to, uh, to the challenges that we face in, in everyday life. One of the important components of what I wanted to discuss, though, was not only just the physiology of it, but why, why is this idea of responding to an infant when it is so innately um, part of the physiology of, uh, of an adult to care for the child and such an innate part of the infant to request that by crying? Why is it that this goal of non-responsiveness seems to be very pervasive in our messages or in many messages to parents. Um, and the goals of non-responsiveness, particularly during infant care, uh, is that if you do not respond over time, you will reduce the amount of time that the infant uh, cries and seeks attention um, for support. Uh, if you do not respond to, if you are non-responsive, if you do not let crying and the, that signaling to determine schedules for feeding, schedules for sleeping, schedules for responsiveness, then you can, you can create very defined um, and scheduled types of interactions with the infant. That comes at a cost, however, of, uh, of not helping the infant's regulatory systems, whether it's for hunger or whether it's for distress, uh, actually be recognized as what drives those physiological needs. If you are non-responsive to crying, you can reduce the number of times the infant will uh, signal during the night for awaking and consequently reduce uh, the need for the parent to be present. However, those goals as parenting goals early on set up a, um, a situation in which the responsiveness to the infant's needs are compromised. And in that compromising, um, there are physiological and neurological changes that uh, Kathleen um, spoke about and uh, are very uh, impactful for the infant and the infant's outcome. Uh, it is, uh, it always is a bit 
mind-boggling to me that when you read the research from a very scientific perspective, responsiveness is viewed as something that is intrusive and maladaptive to the infant. Um, and it's considered to be intrusive and maladaptive because particularly around the area of infant sleep, um, if I respond to my infant, my infant is likely to wake more. My infant is likely to require my presence when they transition to sleep. And although by the time of 18 months and definitively by the time of three years of age, there is no difference in the sleeping patterns between a child who receives, uh, whose parent's present when they go to sleep and whose parent is not. Um, because early on there is likely to be more requests from the infant for the parental attention and responsiveness, it's considered to be intrusive and it's considered to be maladaptive. It's intrusive in and that the infant will not be able to regulate their own um, wake and sleep cycles and they will not be able to uh, regulate their own distress. However, as responsiveness actually leads to secure attachment, securely attached children are much better able to, um, to regulate their own emotions and to um, have healthy regulatory systems in other, in, in other means. So it's very, um, the message both in terms of the lay profession and in terms of the scientific research really focuses away from the idea of responsiveness being a key and essential component to, um, to early infant care. So what I wanted to do uh, was to talk about um, what, what are the, um, the costs of non-responding. The physiological and neurological costs were very clearly outlined in what, um, what, what Kathleen talked about and the social-emotional costs as well as in regard to attachment. And because of those, the inability, the reduction in terms of the skills and capacities. One of the, one of the reasons I, that it is important to, to view the costs of non-responsiveness is that there is a good deal of research. The um, adversity of risk model uh, that Jack Shonkoff has uh, forwarded uh, is built on, uh, in part, this lack of responsiveness because this lack of responsiveness leads to higher levels of stress. Uh, and the outcomes that Dr. Shonkoff has been showing in the research that he does equates to all of the um, bullet items that are here as well as some others um, that are equally uh, distressing. Um, so one of the places that, that's important to look is that how is it that this, this idea of being non-responding, um, does it, is it really, uh, how does it contribute to, uh, to the mother and the infant relationship? One of the questions that, um, that, that that brings us to is, is it important to forward this idea of responsiveness as essential to the care providing? Um, to the care to the care provider in terms of how they determine uh, care relationships this I addressed this in, in part in in research that I had done with moms and infants in New Zealand and one of the questions was whether mother's perception of infants distress at a time of separation was distressing for the infant so in other words as a mom do I see uh, do I see the infants crying at the time of distressing just as something that, that's a natural occurrence or do I see it as something that, that is actually being experienced by the infant as uh, stressful. And mother's perception of infant's distress at the time of separation resulted in the infant's experiencing and the mother's experiencing lower levels of uh, uh, salivary alpha amylase during that, during the time of um, transition to sleep. So for mothers who identified infant stress at the time of, the, who, who's, who rated that a separation could be distressful for their infant, um, both the mother and the infant at the time of separation had lower levels of um, stress 
during that transition period. So the other way that we looked at that was to look at you know, mothers who are responsive to their infants during, um, during nighttime care and during daytime care as well. Uh, being responsive means that, that the infant is a significant driver, a contributor to how that nighttime routine will go and what will be done. It's very simple to, uh, or it's, it's much clearer to be able to say, I'm going to put a baby down at this time uh, and I won't need to tend to the baby until this time unless something dire happens. Um, but flexibility in nighttime care suggests that sometimes that will work out this way and sometimes it will work out that way. And when we looked at that idea of the flexibility, the adaptability, and fluctuating to infant's demands, again, having the infant be a significant contributor to the outcome of care, mothers who were not comfortable with that flexibility but preferred a very set and planned um, nighttime care routine had higher levels of stress and their infants as well had higher levels, physiological levels of distress. So what this is telling us is that um, if, if the message that this, responsibility, this responsiveness and the flexibility to include the infant in as a, a significant contributor to to what is needed, and without responding to that, there are much higher levels of, um, of distress that will occur, and this is saying the same thing here. The idea of endorsing non-responsiveness when infants wake at night, whether endorsing responsiveness, when we took mothers and placed them along that continuum, and we looked at the idea of sleep training and attachment you can see that uh, the infant's security in terms of the, um, their secure attachment behaviors were lower when, um, when mothers endorsed being non-responsive. It didn't mean, um, and that was particularly the case uh, when they used um, sleep training uh, methods, which is to allow your infant to cry to sleep. Um, so that they learn to sleep without parental uh, response and attention. When mothers stress uh, in putting their infants to sleep, when they perceived that their infant's sleep routine was problematic, and generally mothers perceived it to be problematic when their infants woke at night. Now, I, I, I do want to say very clearly that in our research, no mother, no father, no anyone uh, is particularly thrilled with the idea that their infant will wake uh, in the night, um, particularly if uh, their infant is in a um, distant location in a separate room. Um, night, we would all prefer to sleep through the night, but mothers who were least comfortable with their, uh, the idea that their infant would wake um, and perceive their infant waking as a problem rather than just a, um, an occurrence with infant care, uh, their levels of stress were much higher. Um, through the night when they began the initial nighttime routine. The importance of this research is that without the message that responsiveness is very important and with a move away from the idea that responsiveness is very important, then there is the introduction of higher levels of physiological stress. Those higher levels of physiological stress are what Kathleen have pointed out can have um, long-term implications for infants' care and well-being. The other aspect of this in regard to the message of responsiveness being very important, and this was actually a surprising outcome for what, um, what we had found, and that was that when mothers were, uh, were encouraged to move away from being responsive. When they engaged in less responsive care, were less likely to see infants distress uh, at the time of separation as, as distressful for the infant. They had a less clear sense of how to engage in parenting. The questions that we asked were, you know, what you do at nighttime, what's important, uh, what your infant would experience is it important for parents to be close at night. There were many different questions, and it wasn't what, how they answered the question, it was whether they answered, they had any sort of cohesive sense um, of, a, of a parental approach at all, and that seemed to be absent the least, 
the more there was um, a sense that responsiveness uh, wasn't an essential uh, component of care. So in the long run, what we're looking at then is the moving away from the idea of infant-centered care, this responsiveness that has the infant uh, responding to the infant and the infant signals as an important component of care has very long-term implications across all of these different areas for infants um, as they grow to be children and adults. Uh, there is some research that is uh, that further supports that, that parents have a very difficult time um, with this, originally with this idea of non-responsiveness. Even women who uh, engage in uh, sleep training, which is to you know, extinguish signaling behavior, crying behavior at night, find that, um, that they have a very difficult time with this approach to care. That is in part because of the physiological uh, nature of, that, of what, um, what that care environment should look like for, um, for the parent and the infant. So if we refocus then on responsiveness, then we can move back toward the idea of infant-centered care. We begin to uh, look at the importance of the infant in terms of, um, of their communication with the adult for uh, for feeding, for sleeping, just for, for regulating their emotional responses, and that provides a very firm foundation then for later health and later um, uh, well-being. With that, um, George, I'm going to turn it back over to you for uh, questions we might have. Very good. We have two questions. Actually, we have several. And let me just throw the question out to you, and then you'll be able to uh, respond, either you or Kathleen. And the first question is, I'm curious to know if there are sensitive periods for stress beyond childhood, for example, given the rapid changes of adolescence. Could this time period also be somewhat sensitive period for experiences of stress? Uh, yes, it, it, it can be. Just as Kathleen pointed out, that that there are ways to um, to Im to have a positive impact at later ages. Any time where there is a, a stressful situation, but particularly during adolescence and beyond, um, it can have implications for neurological development. Particularly during adolescence, the neurological development that's occurring is the development of the frontal lobe and the prefrontal lobe, and the communications with that circuitry to other areas of the brain. So it can have um, it can have at any time an impact, but uh, during adolescence as well as a very uh, very stressful time, but also a time of neurological development that uh, it, it's a little bit uh, more focused than at early, you know, in those in-between ages. Uh, actually, I'd like to just chime in on that too. I mean, what what we kind of find with kind of trauma exposure in general is, you know, that first five years you tend to get, you know, if you have a trauma or adversity exposure, it, it, the, the effects are a little more pervasive. It's kind of a rewiring. Um, and there are definitely other sensitive periods, but the effects tend to be a little more sort of focal. They don't, you know, because I mean, we see this like, say, for example, with um, combat vets. You know, many of them are like in sort of late adolescence, early adulthood. And, you know, yes, they definitely experience trauma. Yes, they have all these PTSD symptoms, but it doesn't seem to create the sort of global kind of anxiety and things like that, that, you know, something that happens in that sort of early critical period, you know, in that first five years does. Um, you know, so again, like I said, it's just a, you know, yes, definitely effect, but a little more kind of focused. Um, and so, yes, that's definitely a, another vulnerable time. Because again, like I said, you know, that's, a, that's another big group that also tends to have a lot of trauma exposure. You know, um, I think actually the rise of sexual assault, you know, and dating violence and, you know, and peer-to-peer -peer violence. And we're showing, you know, like there was a paper that just came out last year that was talking about bullying, increasing inflammation. And again, not surprising considering how we know the stress system works. Uh, so, yes, yeah, definitely a critical period, but it doesn't seem to create the sort of a, those global effects that you see with early exposure. 
And I, I think, too, in regard to the later behaviors when you're talking about bullying and when you're talking about dating violence and even when you're talking about uh, you know, attention disorders, all of those are so strikingly tied to those early stress response systems because you set up how that stress response system is going to function in that first year of life. And neurologically, the, the structure of the brain is different dependent upon whether there is responsiveness or non-responsiveness during that time. Non-responsiveness sets up a very, um, you know, either an acute or a dampened uh, stress response um, uh, I can't come up with a word, but uh, but just the stress response functions differently dependent upon those early experiences, and it becomes a a mechanism for how we experience stressful responses later, and whether or not, particularly when you get both to the stress response and the attachment, whether we feel a part of or alienated from those social interactions. And you can see the bullying, um, dating violence, all are, are kind of an alienation from, from that socialized sense of interaction. Another question we have here is, has there been any study about the lack of regulation of hunger cues and the development of disordered eating? Mm. There is a, um, yes, <laughs> there is actually. Um, but uh, but it, 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 there is the early stress response feeds into um, is, is associated with obesity and other uh, eating uh, other the, the capacity for the body to understand those eating cues later on. Um, and you see that it's, that, that the cortisol and the experience of the early stress neurologically, are associated then later with um, because they they encompass the um, the hormones and such that that are part of the uh, parasympathetic nervous system as well as the sympathetic nervous system that you will then um, have uh, poor uh, you will have obesity uh, eating. Uh, issues around uh, eating and the understanding of eating, but also the control of eating as um, that stress response and the obesity is then tied with other um, emotional and behavioral disorders. Um, yeah, I'd like to actually kind of tie you down to that too because there's a, there are a number of studies um, that have specifically you know, looked at exposure to trauma, uh, particularly early adversity and later, uh, you know, adult obesity. And the one study that I think of, you know, that I think was particularly striking was from the nurses' health data. So that's about um, 73,000 nurses. And they found actually particularly severe uh, physical and sexual abuse. Uh, increased not only BMI during childhood, but it also then uh, increased the trajectory of weight gain. So, you know, sometimes people think, okay, well, you know, they look at something like obesity and they think it's just like a behavior. Okay, they're eating because they're trying to be unattractive. I mean, you know, I've, I've talked to different researchers who said that. But I actually think, honestly, it's a, it's a much more kind of fundamental. Uh, you change that body system uh, so that it gains weight more easily because the body says, hey, this is an emergency. We better hang on to every single calorie. And you just see right. that in study after study. So there's definitely, you know, behavioral components to it. But I think actually there's a more fundamental physiology to it as well, you know. And again, it's that you know that you know upregulating that stress system just creates all these problems. And we're just seeing just tons of studies now coming out, you know, connecting that. And it's one of the things that kind of honestly drives me a little crazy when, you know, like for example, you know, the American Psych Association a couple of years ago launched this big initiative on obesity. They didn't talk about trauma at all. You know, and wow. it's, it was it was all behavior. It was all you know. How can we get people to eat more fruits and vegetables? How can we get people to exercise? It's like you know that stuff's all fine and good, but what about all these trauma survivors? You know, who may yes. be following all the rules and yet their bodies are just primed to gain weight. You know, and it's like to treat them with you know the kind of disrespect. That's one thing that just drives me absolutely crazy. You know, so yeah, trauma definitely has a huge impact in all of the things involving you know food regulation. Well, that's another problem another that you're blaming the um, blaming the person who, you know, who has this physiological reason why uh, weight gain is so easy and weight loss is so difficult. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Another question is about a trend called baby whys. No. And the question is, <laughs> is this something that is more a non-responsive type of parenting because it's actually parent-led and parent-scheduled, so a trend called baby wise. Yes, I know all about baby wise, yes. Well, I will, tell you, I will tell you what the American Academy of Pediatrics has actually classified it as abuse, because you're starting to see these kids. Wow. Yeah. 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 It's, it's heavy duty stuff, and yeah, it is, you know, it's a very bad, in my opinion, I think in Wendy's opinion too, uh, parenting program. The thing that worries me is, again, like I said, you see, you know, first of all, it's highly stressful for babies. There's no question about that. But what's starting to show up is these kids are starting to show up in the child protection system because they're failure to thrive. You know, and so any, any parenting system that actually where you have results like that, I think, is, is not a good thing. So, yes, I, you know, yes, we know all about that, that program. It's, it's, it is not one that we support. And any type of parent-driven parent and parent-focused approach to parenting that is is accomplished through the non-responsiveness to the infant signals is not a is not a sound approach to care that does not mean that it isn't equally important to take care of the parent and support the parent and the parents needs and be responsive to what the parent needs um, parenting particularly infants although with a teenager, I'd say with teens as well. <laughs> but um, with infants, it's a, it's a, it needs to be a consuming activity. Therefore, there needs to be support of the care providers so that, that that's the mechanism by which those, um, those positive outcomes can be reached. It speaks to, I, I believe, the sense that there needs to be much more support through policy, much more support um, in, in community and health messages in terms of the difficulty of parenting and how we need to provide parents with the support so that they can be um, responsive to their infants. Well, and I think also, too, there's some, you know, kind of behaviorism is still kind of not really died out entirely in terms of particularly parenting uh, guides, you know, and we have this idea that, you know, especially, you know, in the United States, we have this idea that parents need to be in control. And so it's, it's mm -hmm. a, you know, and, 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 you know, the people who sort of promote these things say, oh, yeah, if you don't do this, you know, your child's going to be a drug addict. You know, I mean, I mean I've actually wow. been at conferences and heard people say stuff like that, you know, and it's you know, and to be honest with you, I mean, when you look at kind of like the impact of non-responsive care, I mean, frankly, I think, you know, we could make a pretty good case that the parents, you know, who are doing non-responsive care are actually going to be more likely to have a child as a drug addict. And again, like I said, does that make it, you know, that all, no, 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 I'm not saying that. But I'm saying, you know, that non-responsive care is really, you know, when we look at the trajectories, you know, it's not good in terms of like all the health problems and the depression and the inability to regulate emotions, you know, some of the attentional issues that Wendy was talking about. Um, yeah, so it, it, you know, like I said, it, to the, I think it's absolutely critical that we do support parents in this. And, and again, listen to what parents need, you know, because I mean, one of the things, you know, oftentimes where parents right. will try these different things is because they're desperate to get some sleep. Right. And yeah, it, absolutely. <laughs> you know, and so it's like we gotta we gotta support them in that and say, okay, what can we do that's gonna sort of meet the needs of everybody? I think with parenting, my original work was in um, in parenting and parenting styles, and actually I've begun to because of the nature of what's brought up with the question that was asked, um, and and part of Kathy's uh, Kathy's response. There's a there, there is currently, and, and actually Diana Barman's just come out, uh, there's a new book about authoritative parenting that this has very much the same thing, and that is that there's a sense that there's a continuum where control is on one end and responsiveness is on the other. And so with that, if you aren't controlling, then you are not providing any structure. And structure is very important in in many cultures in the United States, it, it, it has a, a very prime um, location in, in that, that work toward independence. But independence actually comes from responsiveness and um, structure demandingness. And so what, what we need to revisit is that control is not the dichotomy, it doesn't form a dichotomy with responsiveness, but they are both 
important um, individual characteristics of a parenting approach and parenting style. And that we need to provide structure. We need to, because that's, that's, the, that's the socialization and the, the limits within which we all, as children and eventually adults, need to, need to live. But we need to do that in a responsive way. So we have to find ways to, um, to find that together. I've always talked, when I talk directly about infant sleep, so that you know, you, you can, if you want your baby to sleep longer, that may well be the structure, the demandingness that you have as a parent, and, there, um, and if, if that's what it is, then for whatever reasons that, you, that that's what you need, that's fine. But you need to do it in a manner that's responsive, and we have research that shows that you can, you can increase in sleep time while still being responsive. Another question is dealing with parenting classes, and the question is, do you think that it would be beneficial to have parenting classes for middle schoolers? Of course, this would be with the mm. permission of the parents to be able to help the teenagers from an early age learn about responsiveness when they have children eventually. I, I think actually that's a great idea. How about you, Wendy? Well, I think I, I think it's a, I, I think any time we, we tell people that eventually when you're a parent you need to be responsive is a good idea. I think couching it in. Um, in, in something that would also be motivating to a child who's that age, 10, 11, 12, because we're so, at that age, we are so distant from the idea of being parents, and we still haven't really put our parents in, in a place. But if you can couch those discussions in terms, of, in terms that would bring the message home in a developmentally uh, engaging manner for children that age, I think that yes. that would be very important. I think you have the same problem when you talk about parenting to high school students uh, and that right. you need to do that. But I think where you need to do it is in um, when we first have our children or right before we have our children as well. Yes, and I think also the questioner had a very good point. That is perhaps having a quote-unquote babysitting class where you teach them how to be babysitters, which actually is enhancing that aspect of responsiveness mm -hmm. for children who do become those caregivers also. Well, and I think, again, that would be, you know, definitely motivating because, you know, if they're out babysitting and learning how to do some of kind of these basic things, I think that's going to be, you know, kind of immediately good for them. But I think also, too, just sort of long term, you know, it's kind of getting this idea that, you know, babies need to be responded to. And I think that that's a, you know, that's kind of an important message. And any channel we can kind of hit that on, I think, is going to be really great. I think in middle school and in high school, one of the ways to look at that, and it's also um, helpful for children at that age as well, is to teach the necessity to be responsive to other people's needs and how that physiologically feels to them to be um, responded to and how physiologically feels to be responded to as a message. And then that becomes even a more pervasive, this is how we have to treat other people. And then other people are also infants and children, so this is how we have to treat infants and children might be a way to, um, to frame that in a, a manner that would be most helpful and most engaging for children that age and still get to the same outcome, which is an important outcome as the, as the listeners um, noted. The next person asked a question about research that they've actually heard saying that the cry it out method does not produce long-term neurological effects. <laughs> and that I seems consistent with attachment literature. <laughs> yes, well, and so, well that's, um, that's, that's, that's the study Blindy and I met over. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> ah. um, well, that's not, it, it's not the case. And the, it, the study that, that, they're, that they're looking at um, is, is designed in, in such a way, and it's a challenging type of research to do, and the, the outcomes aren't really quite as clear. The research that I had done in regard to sleep training showed that when you have a baby who, uh, whose crying behavior at night is extinguished, which is, is what sleep training does, that they will stop crying. start on a Monday, they stop crying on a Wednesday. Uh, so they appear to be fine. Mother stress level goes down. The infant stress level, however, does not go down. Um, right. And, and so that, that creates an impact a situation in which the mother and the infant, the infant is now no longer communicating distress, their distress state to the mom. 
And whatever happens with the sleeping, that change in terms of the dynamic of that communication is um, is very uh, is is very worrisome. The difficulty with the research that they've shown um, that that's being alluded to here is that there are many different ways in which parents create uh, responsiveness or lack of responsiveness with their children, and how that how that manages over time is very difficult to say. The thing that isn't published in that research that probably is an integral in my mind component to children's outcome over the longer period of five years is that in addition to the sleep training, because sleep training um, is, is such a questionable activity, they also instructed the parents to be responsive. That responsiveness right. is something then that would have been carried through in those later years where the infant sleep behaviors would, would be much more timely in those earlier, um, those earlier points. So really, again, the responsiveness, no matter, no matter what, responsiveness is essential to children's outcomes, irrespective right. of what you're talking about. Well, and you know, just to kind of add, there, you know, with that particular study, there were just a number of methodological issues. <laughs> uh, one is, you know, that just the intervention itself, it was very unclear, you know, in terms of they had two different things that they did. They either did this sort of camping out method where you just sit there with your baby, but you don't respond to them, you know, or you actually just extinguish, as Wendy was saying. Uh, but the other thing is they didn't control for the control group at all. Um, you know, it's like they, you had no sense of what the control group did. You know, there's so many parenting books out there, you have no idea if the control group actually engaged in some of these behaviors as well. They did not assess that. Um, but the other critical thing in this is that the, the group within that sample that was at the most high risk dropped out and they were not there at the five-year follow-up. And I, okay. I, wow. I yeah, think and that's a problem. Message. I, I think as researchers, we're going to, to continue to go back and forth and, and have to try to settle this out more, um, more clearly, and, and there's obviously work to do. I, I think where you can't go wrong, knowing what we know already, is that it is um, that the key is synchronous responding. And whatever you do, you should try to frame it in a way that protects that type of interaction, no matter what it is that is your goal or your outcome. Very good. We have three more quick questions. Another question from one of the participants is that they have two foster children that have gone through a lot of extreme neglect, ages 4 and 12. Mm. What are some of the best ways to help reverse those effects of that neglect on those children? Well, one of the things I just heard at this conference, I was just at a big violence conference, and they were talking about, you know, like, uh, you know, creating safe schools, and they were, you know, working in some pretty high-risk neighborhoods. But, you know, so if they had a, a similar kind of situation where a lot of these kids were coming from, you know, backgrounds of adversity. And one of the things that they taught, especially some of the, you know, sort of middle schoolers and even some of the elementary school age, was to understand what was happening with their brains. And they even said they, they, oh. they would have the, you know, the kids make like a fist with their thumb underneath and they would say, okay, now this, you know, where your thumb is, is that's like the, you know, the older part of your brain, that's the emotion part, this is your thinking part. And sometimes there's going to be part, times when your thinking part can't kind of respond. And it's okay to like acknowledge that and go take a time out if you need to. You know, but helping them kind of understand some of the, their own kind of physiology, that was actually one of the things and they, they, they were getting great results with that. You know, it's just um, you know, sort of, sort of as an intervention. But the other thing I thought that, that I found that is actually really promising is the mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. Um, one of the things, especially when you've got you know, sort of like this ongoing adversity, you have this decreased ability to pay attention to, to regulate your emotions, and they're finding actually within a fairly short amount of time that people who practice this mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, it actually reverses those. Uh, they actually can see changes in the gray matter density within eight weeks in the brain. Wow. Yeah, so I mean, those are really, really powerful techniques. There's a lot of great self-help books on it. And so even just kind of like as a family, kind of learning to do some of those techniques where you sort of kind of can sort of disengage and kind of chill out can actually be very, 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 very helpful. You know, and especially if you can get support from the school also, you know, to kind of help with that process. So yes, I, I think actually 
the message is really hopeful. We used to think, oh my gosh, you know, there was just no changing in this. And again, I think there really is still going to be a lifetime vulnerability to stress, but there's definitely things you can do to counter it. And real quickly, uh, it, does it matter who does the responsiveness to the child, whether it's the mother, father, or another caregiver? No, just as long as everybody who's providing care is responsive. <laughs> the, yeah. the, the and last question. <laughs> the last yeah. question real quick is about, uh, really more, is about nannies. <laughs> would, nannies be a, would nannies be a very good way to maybe supplement a parent's situation where they can get the rest and they can also have a responsiveness and sleep at the same time? Yes. What is, what's important there, mm -hmm. and, and it's the same for daycare, is that you need to provide um, the infant with secure attachment Figures, people that they, oh, people yes. who are consistent, consistent, people who are constant, people who are responsive. So it doesn't, you know, the the baby has a, a bond with the mom and with the dad and all all of that. But um, and Bulby's original work focuses very much on that. But the research is very clear that you need to have somebody for whom that that infant or that young child sees as a secure base, and it doesn't always have to be the mom. Um, and working mothers should, you know, fathers should should be comfortable with that. But when they take their child someplace, one of the things they need to be um, aware of is that they need to ask whether there is somebody who's particularly assigned to the care of their child who's going to be there for their their child. I want to say thank you to Dr. Kathleen Kendall Tackett and Dr. Wendy Middlemiss for sharing with us on a very important topic about early adverse experiences. We are having our next webinar here. Uh, it will be on April 24th at noon, Eastern Standard Time. We're talking about prolonged exposure therapy with veterans. And we have Aaron Smith and we have uh, Dr. Catherine Porter. These two doctors about this very important topic. And you'll be exposed to a type of therapy that is oftentimes considered a frontline treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder. You've been listening to the webinar series here with Division 56. Until next time, we say aloha. Thank you, George. Aloha. And bye, y'all. Bye, everyone. Thank you. It was very good.